Some Anzac remnants remained on the Greek island of Crete and put up a stubborn defense alongside Cretan military personnel and civilians. All right, y'all, welcome back to Combat Arms Channel. Again, I like to try and do special reaction videos for these holidays, and today it is Anzac Day. So that is exactly what we are checking out. We are checking out the Anzacs of World War II. So this is a video by The Front titled, Why the Uncompromising Anzacs of World War II Gave Their Enemies Generals Headaches, which is kind of a mouthful, but I gotta say, I'm definitely excited to check it out, so let's do it. It's a running joke that Australia and New Zealand don't actually exist. However, we can assure you <laughs> is that it? this isn't the case. <laughs> While Tasmania may be fictional, Australia and New Zealand are far from it, and mm. these two allied nations fought with bravery and distinction in the Second World War. In this episode of The Front, we're going to talk a little about the Anzac Corps and then provide you with an overview of Australia and New Zealand in World War II. Hmm. As far as the separation between the Anzac Corps and like other units, like the Australian Army, and then also we checked out the, the Maoris, the those were pretty freaking badass, and they definitely got up to a lot of stuff in World War II. But I'm not sure where the distinction actually is between those units and the actual Anzac, because I think that was like a specific core, what have you. Firstly, let's distinguish the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, or just Anzac Corps, from the Australian Army and New Zealand Army. Okay, there As we go. As the title implies, nice. the Anzac Corps was a military unit comprised of Aussies and Kiwis. It was created in the First World War during the Gallipoli Campaign, though it was disbanded in 1916. The Corps was briefly really? remade in World War II during the Battle of Greece and so too in the Vietnam War and the East Timor Crisis. Nice. The term Anzac, however, is used a little differently in Australia and New Zealand. When Aussies and Kiwis first commemorated the wartime sacrifices of their fathers, sons, husbands, and brothers on the 25th of April 1916, mm. that day was deemed Anzac Day. Though every Anzac Day since commemorates not only the sacrifice of those who fought in the First World War, but the sacrifice of all Australian and New Zealand military personnel in all subsequent conflicts. Okay, I'm not sure. I guess this would be very similar to like a Memorial Day. Um, I mean, we have Veterans Day and Memorial Day, but Veterans Day is more for people who are still serving. Memorial Day is more for people who have fallen during like specific conflicts and whatnot. So I'm not exactly sure. I wonder if Australia has a separate Memorial Day or if New Zealand has a separate Memorial Day or if it's kind of just, you know, lumped into the Anzac Day. But I got to say, it's pretty cool that it was able to persist and sort of encompass more than just, you know, World War I. In Australia, at least, we attend a dawn service and hold a minute's silence for the dead. We really? also wear blood red poppies, the same that bloomed on the raised battlefields of Europe in the Great War. Okay, so they do that too. Nice. So we know that the Anzac Corps briefly served as a distinct unit in World War II, but what else did the Aussies and New Zealanders get up to in the most devastating event in human history? Oh, First, let's take. Is this like a dress uniform? I gotta say, the hats are really freaking cool, but. What's going on with the, uh, are those like the, their shoes? Those don't look too comfortable. And then I don't know if the, those are socks or they just have like a band tied around them. Okay. It's in human hmm. history. Interesting. First, let's take a look at the Aussies. A British Commonwealth nation, the land down under followed Britain into war against Nazi Germany on the 3rd of September, 1939, and against hmm. Germany's allies later on. The Australian Army, Royal Australian Air Force, and Royal Australian Navy oh, they had an Air Force? many theatres of war, though their contributions Makes in sense, Western I guess. Europe, the Mediterranean, and North Africa, and the Pacific are perhaps their most renowned. Hmm. Some 13,000 Aussie pilots and air crews served in British and Australian air units in the defence of Britain and over Western Europe. No kidding. In terms of percentage, these men sustained the highest casualty rates of all branches of the Australian military, 20%. Hmm with just shy of 3,500 Aussie pilots and airmen paying the ultimate price. I wonder why that is, if they just had like less training or less time to do training, or if I guess the instructors just taught something different. I don't know, if you guys have some more background for that, let me know, but 20% is pretty insane. To go into an occup occupation, even during World War II, where you know the casualty rate is 20%, yeah, it's going to be pretty freaking scary. Air Force and Navy units also supported the June 1944 D-Day landings, helping the oh, Allies nice. gain a foothold in Normandy. Some of these squadrons went on to support the Western Allies' occupation of Germany in the final days of war in Europe. 
Hell yeah. Royal Australian Navy warships clashed with Italian vessels in the Mediterranean in 1940. Oh, and man. Okay, hold on. These are always really cool to see, like, the differences. And I got to say, this one looks a lot freaking meaner than whatever this is. I, don't, I, I can't really tell. I don't even know. I haven't heard many stories about the Italian Navy or the Australian Navy, for that matter. So I'd like to find some specific stories about some, like, well-known battles between them. And Australian ground forces made their mark in December that year in the Allied Operation Compass, part of the North African campaign. Mm. The Aussies Damn, there's a lot happening in North Africa. Most bravery in this operation, notably when the 6th Australian Infantry Division assaulted the Italian-held Libyan fortress of Badia. In this battle, the Aussies, bolstered by the Brits, ultimately took some 36,000 Italian prisoners and inflicted an additional 4,500 casualties. <laughs> They also managed to capture some 800 Italian vehicles and 400 Italian artillery guns. No kidding. How do you even like manage that? It's just, whenever I hear numbers like that for prisoners, I mean, then you see this where it's like literally a convoy of prisoners. I don't even know. How would you go about just like, I mean, I guess if you sort of encircle their defenses, that it makes sense. But for thousands of people to, to surrender like this, it's just, I don't know. It's unheard of today, obviously, but it's just insane to see. Conversely, only some 450 Allied personnel became casualties of this battle. The Aussies fought a different Damn. war in the Pacific, staving off the brutal Japanese right on Australia's doorstep. In the battles of Malaya and Singapore, thousands of Aussies were captured by the Imperial Japanese troops, no with 15,000 falling into enemy hands in Singapore alone. Further losses were endured in the New Guinea campaign, which went all the way from January 1942 to just about the end of the war. See, I don't know anything about those fought campaigns. And died in the bloodthirsty 1945 Borneo campaign too, a conflict famed for its savage guerrilla warfare in which Special Operations Australia, or SOA, played a crucial huh. role. Australia herself tasted Japanese ruthlessness, most notably in the February 1942 bombing of Darwin, the Northern Territory's capital. This was the first of some 100 Japanese air raids exacted on Australia throughout the war. This is the and first the bombing time of Darwin remains. This is the first time I'm hearing about any of this. I mean, the campaigns. I've heard a little bit about some of those campaigns, but I'm not really too savvy on any of that. Especially like anything that happened in Singapore or like that area during World War II. I don't know a whole lot about it, but I got to say the the bombings and whatnots, never heard about that previously. And Dar Darwin, I'm not exactly sure where that is. Okay, so Darwin is like literally in the middle and top of Australia. So yeah, I guess it makes sense that it would be a target, but for them to bomb cities like that, yeah, it's never going to be kosher. It's never going to roll over too well. Back on Australia in all the island nation's history. Defences hmm. were carried out primarily by the Royal Australian Navy and Royal Australian Air Force, though the Yanks were there to lend a helping hand too. Hell yeah. So, seeing as Australia was bombed by the Japanese, it must be real. But what about New Zealand? What did they get up to in the war? We got well, a good idea. as for the Kiwis, they also followed Britain into war against Germany on the 3rd of September 1939, and like the Aussies, fought in many different theatres, in many cases <laughs> alongside their Australian comrades. Yep. New Zealand's principal overseas force was the Second New Zealand Expeditionary Force, or 2NZEF, while mm. its air force was the Royal New Zealand Air Force and its navy was the Royal New Zealand Navy. Huh. New Zealand's contributions to the Allied war effort in Europe were primarily through its air force, whose pilots and airmen served in Kiwi units under the RAF or directly in RAF squadrons. That's pretty cool how they were like their own thing. I wonder how many like fighters and bombers and sort of equipment they're actually allotted though. Like the Aussies, they fought for the Queen in the Battle of Britain. Generally, oh, really? directly in the RAF, Kiwi pilots went wherever the RAF went and bombed whatever the RAF bombed. Nice, the okay. The men of the 2NZEF fought hard in the bloody Battle of Monte Cassino in March 1944 too, hmm. playing a crucial role in what would ultimately lead to the Allied capture of the town and castle. New Zealand artillery units, in particular, paved the way for the Polish and British offensive which gained the Allies the town. Hell yeah. The Maldi Battalion was also present here under the 2nd New Zealand Division. Yep, we know about that. By them. the bullets of a stubborn German defence, the battalion suffered devastating losses with 128 out of the 200 Maldi soldiers in it becoming casualties of war. Damn, no That's kidding. a whopping 64% of the unit. 
That's like brutal. the Australians, the New Zealanders feared a Japanese invasion, so they fought hard against Imperial Japan in the Pacific. Hmm. While New Zealand did have some violent encounters with Axis naval vessels in its own waters, the country did not feel the heat of Japanese bombs, and an invasion never came to pass. Hmm. So when I was a kid, we learned a decent amount about World War II, but I think it was just enough to like spark your interest in like World War II and certain battles. But as far as learning about all these different fronts, of course, there's not really enough time for that. So that's why it's awesome checking out these videos to learn a little bit more about those specific areas. Especially like India going against the Japanese. I didn't know that happened. I didn't know Australia was going against the Japanese, especially, you know, doing stuff in Singapore and whatnot. It makes sense. But again, it's just not things you really get exposed to unless you watch videos like this. With Kiwi pilots fighting under the British RAF in other theaters, the Americans supported the Air Force in the Pacific by lending them planes and whatnot. To put New Zealand's okay, there you go. Again, into perspective, that's pretty cool to it now. suffered proportionately more casualties than any other Commonwealth nation involved in the Second World War. 12,000 of New Zealand's 1940 population of 1.6 million lost their lives in the conflict. Damn. Now, we did say earlier that the Anzac Corps was remade in the Battle of Greece, so let's take a look at that a little bit further. All right. In March 1941, the Australia 1st Corps, with the New Zealand 2nd Division under it, landed in Greece to defend the nation against a German invasion. Hmm. It was soon after this that the combined Aussie Kiwi unit was officially renamed the Anzac Corps, though this title was short lived. The so I know the, the Maori battalion was actually in Greece as well. I think like Crete specifically, if I remember. Again, that's just a whole area that I'm not really too familiar with, especially like Greece and Italy and that sort of role in World War II. Not really too familiar, but I think the most exposure we got to that was just learning about the Anzacs and the Maori battalion over there. Invasion, unlike the Italian invasion before it, was hugely successful. And the Anzac Corps, along with the Greeks and Brits, was mostly undone. The footage is so cool. Instead of fleeing Greece entirely, however, some Anzac remnants remained on the Greek island of Crete and put up a stubborn defense alongside Cretan military personnel mm. and civilians. These were primarily the Australian 6th Division's 19th Brigade and some Kiwi units, including the aforementioned Maori Battalion, which yes, took sir. part in a series of savage engagements throughout the island. The bayonet in more charges. In one instance, the battalion carried out bayonet charges, <laughs> yes. and bludgeoning <laughs> hundreds of Germans to death. Jeez. In the latter half of 1941, many Australian units left the Mediterranean and North Africa to contest the Japanese in the Pacific. Some Aussie units, Damn. such as the Australian 1st Corps' 9th Division, remained. These men didn't have it easy, especially in the Libyan port city of Tobruk, which came under siege by the Axis and was largely defended by Australian troops. No kidding. But the Kiwis were done licking their wounds after the Battle of Greece and, alongside other allied nations, came to their Aussie brothers' aid on the 18th of November 1941 in Operation Crusader. Damn, it's just 1941 yeah, at this with point. Formal's Africa Corps and ultimately sent the German general running. Hmm. The Australian 9th and New Zealand 2nd Division fought and sustained heavy casualties together in the first and second battles of El Alamein II. I gotta say, I, I kind of take for granted how much all these other countries were doing prior to 1941, which obviously that's when the, the US entered World War II. But yeah, from 1939 to 1941, there was a lot going on. I mean, you gotta think even like the, the Battle of Britain and everything was going on during that time. So there was a lot going on. It's not really anything that's taught from our perspective. Obviously, the contributions of Australia and New Zealand to the Allied victory in World War II extended far beyond what we've covered today. There were also many other battles in which Aussies and Kiwis fought and died side by side. Hmm. Far too many for one video. For now, we hope we've provided you with a decent overview of these two fighting nations. Uh, yeah, I'd say so. What, however, interests you more? Would you like to learn more about Australia, New Zealand? How about the Anzac Corps, both in the Great War and in conflicts following the Second World War? What? <laughs> ATATs, okay. So I definitely want to learn more about the Aussies and the Kiwis in the Pacific theater because when I think about it as an American, all I think about is the US Marines sort of doing their island hopping campaign. But you have to think there's like Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, all of that stuff going on that wasn't really on my radar until like we check out videos like this. So if you guys have any videos or stories specifically about the, the Aussies and Kiwis in the Pacific, I would definitely like to hear about that. Or if you have any sort of like 
familial ties or stories about the Anzac specifically, definitely share it down below. I think that's definitely some of the more valuable stuff that I get from the channel is y'all sharing your experiences and everything down in the comment section and the Discord. So definitely keep that up. It is really, really fascinating to hear all of that, especially when you can sort of relate it to some of the stuff or the battles that we actually see in the videos. I don't know, it's just kind of mind blowing, especially for me, like my family isn't from a, a military background, so I don't really have any of those stories. So kind of getting it third hand from some of y'all is pretty cool for me to check out. But yeah, if you guys have anything to recommend, definitely throw them down below. I know by the time this video is going out, there's not going to be as many videos going out because I'm not going to be in my office doing videos because this is recorded probably like a month prior or something like that. So yeah, I apologize for the lack of uploads, but I will get back to it whenever I can. And I will check out those recommendations that you guys are putting down below. Of course, I have my list going and I try and prioritize the list, but I also try and give some love to countries that we haven't checked out recently or haven't checked out at all. So definitely keep them coming. Thank you again for supporting the channel. And thank you again for sharing those personal stories because again, those are some of the coolest things that I get from the channel specifically. But that is it for this video. I'll see you all in the next one.